When I was in high school, I had a couple of close friends, Jason and Brian. We did quite a bit together, and when it came time to graduate, Jason had to move away to Lexington, South Carolina with his family due to his father's work. After we graduated and he had completed his move with his family, my friend Brian and I were invited to pay a visit for a weekend to his new house. We decided out of boredom to start hiking around in the nearby forest and countryside which we found had a scenic river. It was a beautiful area and felt quite peaceful, but we ended up getting lost. We decided to keep following the river as we lost track of which direction was upstream or downstream, with no sounds of civilization anywhere we could hear. We quickly became concerned about finding a telephone to call Jason's mom or dad to get us from wherever we were, even though there was no paved road or street that we could find nearby. As we kept following the river, we came to this old church-looking building made of really old red bricks with a dirt parking lot and a dirt road leading up to it. It was very encroached with growth and bushes. We decided to go inside and see if there were people, and maybe ask to use their telephone and get the address for this location. We noticed there were a few old cars which looked to be 70s or 80s, possibly Novas, four of them. Very dirty and rusted in this dirt parking lot with flat or missing tires. They were all white colored, or used to be, and parked in a row side by side. As we got closer, we heard gospel music sounds and some singing inside the church. We were relieved that there were people. So we went into the church, which appeared to be rather old and dilapidated. We peeked past the main doors to the hall and saw what I estimated was a couple dozen people dressed as nicely as they could, though they clearly were poor. When we went inside, the old white-haired woman wearing horn-rimmed glasses who was playing the church piano stopped playing and she looked at us with no expression on her face. What happened next really stuck with me and I will never forget it as long as I live. Everyone in that church stopped singing and put down their song sheets and they all slowly turned their heads and looked at us with the most vacant and unwelcoming glares. Jason said we're sorry to interrupt, we just want to use your phone to call my folks to come get us. Nobody spoke. It was dead silent in that church other than the wooden pews creaking from the weight of the people in them. So we just slowly backed out of the door and let it close behind us and looked at each other in ominous fear and quietly left. We started walking up that dirt road, and when Brian mentioned that there were no crosses or anything Christian in there, we looked back up the road to see that maybe a dozen of those people, all men, had walked out in the front of the church and were standing there watching us intently as we walked along the road. This freaked us out, and we began to sprint up that dirt road for what felt like a good half hour. We finally came to a very old, broken-down gas station that looked like one of those old full-service stations. We went inside to find that the shelves were mostly empty and dusty from a quick glance, and an old, overly tanned, swarthy man with a really oily and dirty baseball cap was behind the counter reading some old book with ragged edges and yellowed pages. He looked up and said, you boys lost, huh? Just head out that way you came in and make a left and follow that road till you see a telephone pole, and just go right at the pole down the trail and it'll take you to a highway. We thanked the man and left quickly, and as we walked down the road to the telephone pole the man told us about, again looked back, and the old man was out in front of the gas station with his arms folded, just staring at us with a rotten tooth grin on his face. We got to the pole, made the right, and followed that trail to the nearest highway, after about a good half hour of walking in the twilight. It had just gotten dark as we got to the highway, and we tried to wave down a few people passing by, but nobody stopped. Thankfully, a police officer saw us and pulled over to help us. We told him we were lost and gave him Jason's address, to which he whistled and said we really were lost. It took about 30 minutes for that officer to drive us back to Jason's, and during the chit-chat, he told us we needed to be careful out in those woods, as there are some crazy witch folks in it. A long time ago, I'm talking like 8 years ago, two friends and I, James and Sean, did something really stupid. But at the time, doing stupid things was what we did to pass the time. We're not really friends with James anymore, but Sean and I still talk often, and so oftentimes we'll talk with each other about this story. We were 19 years old. We lived in Bumfuck, New Jersey. Lots of vacant houses in our old town. And atop a hilly road not far from our houses was an abandoned church. Locals knew about the church, it was on a closed off road, and it had been abandoned for many years. I'm not sure if it's still standing or what the current state of it is, as I live in Florida now, but James, Sean, and I being the troublemaking thrill-seekers we were, 
came up with this genius plan of bringing a Ouija board to the church late one night. This was October, so I guess we were doing it in honor of spooky season. Sean had the Ouija board in his closet, so he brought it. I drove the three of us, so I first picked up James, then Sean, and we just drove straight towards the church. Since the road up the hill to the church was literally blocked off, we had to park on the side of the road and walk from there. We followed the road up the hill to the church, using one flashlight at first so as not to overdo it and draw any possible attention. But once we were atop the hill, we pretty much all three of us turned on our flashlights. The church was surrounded by woods in basically all directions and had a gravel parking lot alongside it. The church had been broken into a million times before and was littered with graffiti. So the big front door was already ajar. Two of us had to work together to pull it open because it scraped on the floor though. Once inside, we naturally just looked around the place with our flashlights to make sure no one else was in there. It was definitely creepy being in that place at night. Sean set up the Ouija board. Then he pulled out these three candles from his backpack as well, and he laughed and said it would add to the experience. He placed the three candles in a triangle formation around the board, and as they were all lit, we turned off our flashlights. Now the only light in the whole place was from the candles, creating a much more eerie and uncomfortable vibe. We really couldn't see more than maybe six feet in all directions. So we began playing with the Ouija board. Sean was doing most of the talking. At this point, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he definitely opened with is anybody there and the typical cliche Ouija board questions. The planchette started to move and we started to laugh. I knew it was one of them doing it. I feel like it's not possible to play with a Ouija board with your friends without someone jokingly moving around the planchette. We went along with it though, and whoever was moving it spelled out a few words. As this was going on though, we heard a weird crack type sound come from the altar of the church. Best way I could describe it is it sounded like a big piece of wood cracking in half. It was loud and it sounded like it was done by someone. We all jumped in reaction and hurried to shine our phone's flashlights in the direction of the altar. There was no one there as far as we could see. I think both of them were just as freaked out as I was after that. But the place was old and falling apart, so some weird noises here and there didn't seem that crazy, and so we kept going. We all took turns asking the board questions, but the planchette was no longer moving. I think because that crack sound freaked all three of us out and now we were taking it more seriously. This went on for some time, until another sound from the altar area broke the silence again. But before we even had time to shine our lights over there again, something landed on the Ouija board causing all of us to jump and scream. It was a rock about the size of a golf ball. All three of us just had our hands on the planchette two seconds ago, and there was no way any of us could have done that. We all three got up and ran back out of the church screaming, leaving the Ouija board and candles behind. We ran all the way down the hill and back to my car, and fearing we were being chased, we didn't stick around. I drove us all back to James's house, where we just sat in the car for a good half hour talking, wondering what exactly just happened. Sean is very religious and superstitious as well. He was confident we had reached a spirit of some kind. I don't really believe in any of that stuff. I believe there was someone else in the church with us, which I find to be equally terrifying. Sean went back to the church the next day with James to get his Ouija board back. And to make things even stranger, the Ouija board was missing, but the candles were still in place. When they saw it was missing from the entrance, they decided to just leave right away. This remains to be the single scariest experience of my life. This happened in Warren County, Georgia, a very rural inland part of the state. I was with my girlfriend Marissa and we were driving around checking out the area, seeing if it was somewhere we'd like to live. It was very quiet and spacious, which is what we wanted. We're both Roman Catholic. She likes to go to church a little more than I do though. It was a weekday in the middle of the day and not much traffic at all. We checked out a bunch of things in the area that would be important to see before deciding on moving to an area. Since Marissa has been an equestrian for most of her life, a big point of us moving to a rural area was for her to have a barn for her horses. After checking out some properties listed for sale, we happened to pass by a small, cute looking church on the side of this very quiet road with a bunch of cars in the parking lot. This church wasn't far from the last property we just looked at, so Marissa shook my shoulder and said we should see if a mass was going on, see if it's nice. And so I pulled into the little dirt-like parking lot for the building and parked next to some old red minivan. A lot of the cars in the parking lot were on the older side, in fact I'd say most of them. 
I mentioned that to Marissa as we got out of the car, and she agreed and said it was probably because it was a lower income area. I opened the door to the church for us and we stepped in, and it was a pretty small inside as we expected. I'd say there were five rows of pews, each cut in half in the middle by the nave, or center aisle. There had to be at least 20 people in there, though they were not an older crowd. Usually in every mass, big or small, you'd see a decent amount of seniors, but based on the backs of everyone's heads in there, everyone appeared to be in their 30s to 40s. It seemed everyone was sitting in silence for some kind of prayer. As we sat down in the back, the people closest to us started looking at us, like one at a time. And as others noticed the staring, they would look to see what the others were staring at and then look at us. Marissa and I looked at each other, then nervously looked back at everyone. All we could think to do was smile, but no one smiled back. They were giving us the most unwelcoming stares, and I just realized none of these people were dressed even remotely nicely for a mass. What was going on here? This was when I realized there were no women in here, not a single one besides Marissa, and the stairs. They seemed to be staring more at Marissa than me. A man in a mask at the front of this alleged church, by what I guess was supposed to be the altar, then stepped up and pointed at us and said, who invited you here? I took it upon myself to answer for us, and said that we were just passing by and saw that a mass was going on and we wanted to join. The man was clearly not a priest, and this was clearly not a Roman Catholic church. The masked man said, you need to leave now. By now, every last person in the church was looking at us. I said, come on, honey, and we got up and hurried out and ran to the car. We wasted no time sitting in the car. I got us out of that parking lot right away, but we both noticed in the rearview mirror someone from the building getting in their van in the parking lot. I felt like there was no way they were going to follow us until we saw that gray van catching up to us in the mirror. I had Marissa GPS the Warren County Sheriff's Office, and we drove straight there. The van was behind us the whole time, not on our ass, but close enough that it was obvious. The second we pulled into the public safety parking lot, the van kept driving down the road. When it was gone, we simply drove straight home and never looked at Warren County again. We clearly ended up in some kind of cult meeting, but I don't get why they had someone follow us, nor why they were having their meeting in broad daylight, or why they didn't at least lock the door. When I was a Cub Scout, we would always have our meetings somewhere in a Catholic elementary school, whether it was in the school gym or in one of the adjacent rooms. I was like eight years old when this happened, and it was disturbing. But before I get into why I'm telling you that, let me start from the beginning. It started a few days earlier when I was at mass with my mom and my brother like we'd go to every other week. We usually would be late, so we'd either sit in the back or stand by the doors if there were no seats. Today, we sat all the way in the back corner. My mom and then brother entered the pew first. I sat on the end. At some point during the mass, I noticed an older man with glasses and a white mustache who was standing against the wall to the left of me looking at me. As I glanced over, he smiled and I still remember vividly the stupid, creepy face that he made as he was trying to be funny. But I was eight, I wasn't a toddler. It felt weird and uncomfortable. I did my best to look away, but I could see him keep looking over to me every few seconds. I looked back at him, and once again, he made another weird face that I assume he was making to try and be funny. It just came off as weird again. My mom noticed it this time, and tapped me on the shoulder and whispered to ignore him. I believe she gave him a dirty look as well. The next time I looked in that direction, the man wasn't there anymore. He had walked somewhere else. The next thing I remember from that mass was going up for communion, and then as I got back to my seat, the man was back in that spot again and he was staring at me, just smiling the whole time until I got back to my seat. My mom noticed it again, and since we got the communion, we just left. My mom said on the way out she didn't like the way that guy was looking at us, specifically me. Now fast forward to when scouts come into play. Towards the end of our meetings, we'd sometimes have little fun contests or games, and this day in question we were having a scavenger hunt. The items we were supposed to be finding all tied into the theme of scouting, I remember some of the objects on the list being a first aid kit, a rope, a flashlight, things of that nature. We were split into two teams, and we all had a copy of the list, and the team to find the most items would win. So we all split up. The play area ranged from the gym to the cafeteria to some of the adjacent rooms. I was running around rooms and tiny hallways I'd never even seen before looking for any of the items I could find on the list. 
I wasn't having much luck. Eventually, I found myself in this very narrow hallway in the back section of the cafeteria by the kitchen. In this hallway was one of those ice cream fridges filled with, like, ice pops. I looked inside the fridge for any of the items. Nothing. But then I decided to be sneaky and take one of the ice cream pops. As I did, I heard a man's voice to the right of me. I looked over and saw that man from the church a few days earlier, walking over to me smiling. He said something like, don't let them see you taking that. He shut the fridge door and grabbed my hand and told me he had some better treats in the back where the kids aren't allowed. I broke my hand free from his grip and tried to walk away scared, and he grabbed my wrist this time tightly. I turned to him and he went, shh, calm down. I yelled help, and he let go of me and said stop it. I ran back to the gym and told the cub master what happened. Thankfully my cub master was an actually nice, caring man, probably because he was a father himself, and he told my mom about it. I told my mom it was that same man from the church, and my cub master would help my mom in reporting that man to the church. It turned out that that man worked for the church. I'm not sure what exactly he did, but he lived on the church grounds, which explained why he was there. What makes me sick, though, is that allegations came out against that man from an altar boy's parents, claiming he touched him inappropriately. The disgusting thing is, I can imagine what he was planning on attempting to do if I actually followed him to wherever he was trying to take me. I don't know if that man went to prison or what, but I know the church cut ties with him after this.